Welcome, everyone. I am Stein Bussels, Chair of the Department Art History at Leiden University. I'm pleased to see so many people attending the lectures today. We have Claudia Jongstra and Anne-Sophie Lehmann as our speakers. They will talk about the work of Claudie and her latest exhibition at the Lake Hall in Leiden. The talks are part of a series, the so-called Leiden Museum Talks. Due to COVID-19, the museum talks are completely online, although the talks today were originally planned to take place in the Lake Hall. But due to the new restrictions taken by the Dutch government, that is unfortunately no longer possible. We would like to thank the Lakenhal and especially Nicole Roepers, Anouk Heesbeen de Vos and Roxanne van Kote for organizing the talks with us, as well as Femke Stockel, Antine Hartman and Sandrine de Jong of Communication and Marketing of Leiden University. Special thanks goes to Sven Dupré, who would have had a prominent role in the talks today if they would have taken place physically. He worked closely with Claudie Jongstra, among other occasions for Claudie's exhibition now in Malines, Mechelen, Belgium, Back to Black, that presents the result of a study of early modern recipes to manufacture the Burgundian black. So our first speaker is Claudie Jongstra herself. As an artist and activist, Claudie strives to revitalize the connections between humanity and nature, between knowledge and material through her artworks and their holistic chain of creation. She's known internationally for her large scale murals made from felted wool from her own flock of sheep and dyed with plant pigments grown in her sustainable working farm lab. Often installed in large public spaces, Claudie Jungstra's oeuvre is included in many international museums and collections. Claudie, I'm first going to install your PowerPoint and then I give you the floor. Thank you very much for being here with us. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Stan, for uh, this beautiful introduction. And also thank you, um, everyone in the Lagen Hall, for ha having this incredible exhibition after two years <laughs> and working together. Um, it's very often, um, um, yeah, I mean, the work behind the scenes is very often unknown, but I can uh, assure you that it was a very intense process, but it brought a lot of richness and, and layers to the work. Um, I would like to start with um, um, yeah, a few projects uh, we did uh, recently, uh, art-related projects, because uh, we do more than just, uh, the studio does more than just art making. Uh, as you said in the, in the introduction, it's also a lot about uh, lately about activism, and um, I will um, I will uh, try to explain how our uh, latest project relates to art, but also uh, how they relate to ecology and community. And this is, um, of course, uh, the work. It's called Nine for uh, for the exhibition uh, in the Museum de Lakenhal. It was uh, in collaboration with Artechne and especially with Sven and the team uh, developing. Uh, this beautiful uh, layering black uh, palette, uh, as you can see, also uh, not only on the floor but also on the on the both sides of the walls. Uh, it's a triptych work. It's called uh, Cosmic Cry. Mm, it's um, it's um, uh, it's about darkness. Do we experience darkness um, since? Um, uh, yeah, especially in in uh, in, in an environment. Uh, where we live in the north, you really can experience the rarity of uh, of uh, of darkness, and um, that makes it also interesting because if you see in the dark, you can um, stimulate and you can also awaken uh, sensitivity, and that's also where the work nine is about. It's about uh, sensitivity, about tactility, about seeing nuances, about seeing palettes, about um, uh, relearning again that these kind of qualities are major important in uh, in your involvement. The other work in the exhibition uh, is uh, is called Woven Skin. It is um, the last uh, stop uh, in uh, its journey. It traveled all over the world um, from 
different places to uh, cities, to rural communities. And the meaning of uh, woven skin was uh, to, to be a stage, kind of a podium for um, um, lectures, uh, people who have a good sense of, um, of uh, climate uh, urgencies. And uh, we tried uh, in the journey, a uh, woven skin um, had, uh, had, had been, we tried to, to really um, yeah, make an impact. It also went to Palermo, part of Manifesta, we uh, did a lot of workshops with um, uh, immigrants whose, um, you can say, color, natural color DNA or natural craft making DNA still is, uh, is, is, is very awake. And you can um, experience that a lot of the, the makers' um, qualities in uh, these cultures that they still are very vivid. This was uh, two years ago, was the start of uh, the journey of Woven Skin. Part of the tour was, uh, um, uh, it was part of Leeuwarden uh, Cultural Capital. This was in Groningen in, the, in an old factory, Suikerfabriek, and uh, here it, uh, it had its first entree. Um, this is a recent work in an exhibition in uh, Limburg's Museum in Venlo. It, is, uh, it was my first experience working with a, with a creative director from Toneelgroep Maastricht, um, theater, uh, you can see it's really theater. Uh, uh, the, the, the curator, uh, uh, Servé, um, uh, uh, had um, yeah, a big uh, connection to uh, uh, the river, the Maas, because uh, Toneelgroep Maastricht is located in uh, Maastricht where the river uh, plays a very important role and um, there was a the, there was a mass grave found um, a few hundred uh, existing uh, a few hundred years old and this grave had uh, like i think 60 or 65 uh, uh, horses uh, uh, were found in that grave so for him it was like this 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 metaphor a river uh, can be uh, violent, a river can be uh, soft, a river can be uh, can have many characters. And um, this uh, was a collaboration with Belinda de Brukere, who made this uh, incredible horse. And we made um, four tapestries embracing or sheltering this, um, this, uh, this installation. Details of, uh, of my work. Uh, it is um, always, you can say, painting with fibers, natural fibers, and um, fibers, they intertwine, and then um, this incredible magical process of making, um, coming from um, woolen and, and silk and mohair yarns, uh, adding water to it, and then in a few seconds, you will have an incredible uh, yeah, non-woven material. This is an installation um, in 2016 in SF MoMA. Uh, uh, you can say it was um, uh, related to earth qualities, San Francisco soil, uh, what kind of treasures to be found uh, still there. And uh, it's, um, it is, uh, it's called Aarde, uh, Earth. It's, uh, it's all about respect for uh, the qualities of, um, of the earth. And we had worked with uh, local um, uh, yeah, herbalists, and they had grown plants for us uh, for for two years before 2016. Uh, the exhibition opened, and we um, uh, we collected uh, raw flowers, dried, and uh, also seeds, and they were implemented in uh, in this work in this work of art. Recent work in uh, in the Dutch. Uh, uh, sustainable bank in uh, Utrecht. It's uh, Triodos Bank. It's a uh, it's a work uh, with a lot of. Um, uh, it's a very colorful palette. It is. Um, it's a composition of uh, of um, many aspects of uh, even the Burgundian black, but also uh, walnut colors are in there, and the 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 race of onion skins, um, a lot of herbs, and uh, as you can see. Uh, the quality of natural dyes is uh, one of the quali qualities of natural dyes is that it's always harmonized with with its environment. You can see it 
it easily uh, takes its place in a building without being um, very uh, be being very loudly there or present, but just taking its place um, in a in a very uh, with respect shy way. But um, people experience a lot of times my work as as uh, is it have always been there. Uh, the presence is always very natural. This is one of the largest installations I uh, ever made with my team. It's a triptych. It's in uh, uh, it's called Fields of Transformation, University of Pennsylvania. A lot of hand stitching too. I think ten thousand hand stitches in the work. After it's it was realized, we made it um, or we enriched the work with uh, with with hand spun yarns, and uh, it was another extra layer uh, added to the to the tapestry. Restaurant in uh, in the Netherlands. Part of uh, part of the, uh, the concept was that we used literally used uh, natural dyes coming from the garden. A lot of herbs uh, were used uh, and uh, and made a connection to this farm to table uh, restaurant. This is a work we uh, we uh, developed uh, together with Google. Uh, it was an experiment um, in uh, during the Salon de Mobile. And uh, one, uh, the idea behind it was uh, making a space with uh, natural materials, clay walls, tapestry, and uh, people could enter this um, this uh, space uh, five maximum with a bracelet, and the bracelet would uh, measure would would give data because it would measure your um, mobility, your heartbeat. Uh, if people were sweating, uh, anxiety, or uh, or uh, the opposite, and uh, it appeared uh, because there were, I think, uh, you know, thousands of people um, uh, were in that space and having this experience. And um, one of the results were, was that um, this kind of uh, yeah, it, surroundings with natural materials that they really uh, give you a, a feeling of of comfort. And um, it really um, yeah, makes you feel uh, uh, at ease. Fashion is also uh, something we, uh, we, uh, we, yeah, we are attracted to because fashion designers, especially, uh, uh, I mean, we saw in this, uh, in, this, in this corona crisis, we saw fashion is, is uh, having a, a big moment um, uh, nowadays because um, how do we see fashion in the future? Uh, it is um, um, it's very important that the awareness uh, that the role of fashion designers as John Galliano and all these major brands that their role is and their influence is 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 intensely and uh, that's why it's one of the reasons we work together with fashion designers because they can be uh, guides or leading uh, us towards another way of how do we relate to fast fashion, ultra fast fashion, and uh, um, make the transition uh, into more sustainable uh, fashion, not only the use of sustainable materials, but also the locality of materials, uh, knowing their sources and their ethics. And uh, this is uh, one uh, way of, uh, of making ourselves uh, visible via fashion. Um, with Victor and Rolf, the collection, uh, a spiritual glamour we worked six months on uh, on this uh, on this uh, collection the left uh, uh, piece is uh, is to be seen in the in the exhibition in the laken hall and um yeah you can see the the the, the richness of, uh, of of the of the black palettes and um the materiality it's very sculptural i think they they really showed um uh, that fashion haute couture can be uh, very theatrical and it made a lot of impact. We got a lot of response on this uh, collection. This is the last, it was, uh, this is part of the uh, OMA exhibition in the Guggenheim, the future of, uh, of the countryside, the potential of countryside. How do we uh, see rural uh, environments? Can we um, uh, stimulate uh, the potential of these rural communities? And um, and land and uh, we uh, we made uh, very literally in in in, uh, in green fabrics we uh, we related to this uh, to this uh, topic. So a lot of my work it has yeah has a big connection of course to farming 
stimulating bio, uh, biodiversity and um, uh, ec ecological awareness. Uh, and it starts uh, always with uh, with my main source material, which is um, uh, wool from a very local uh, sheep. It's called Drent Heat. Uh, is uh, is the name of the sheep it was um, um, is the oldest breed in uh, northern europe we, uh, there are not too many left uh, of this breed because uh, what they're really good at is uh, landscape preservation so uh, basically they prevent uh, a land from becoming a forest so the the, the sheep they eat small trees and uh, the shepherd uh, having a lot of knowledge not only about animals but also about uh, 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 land and about biotopes and uh, uh, this land uh, in the southeast of Friesland is um, is you can say it's not very rich. The soil is is quite poor, but this is where these sheep are really. Uh, I mean, they can maintain there very well. And we had also uh, a herd uh, uh, next to this, uh, where we are based, but because due to um, artificial fertilization, the soil is so rich. And these sheep, uh, I mean, their their constellation is not really, uh, um, yeah, they get really sick when they when they graze there. So this is the only land that can um, they can uh, uh, be placed. The wool is um, is very, uh, yeah, it has very long fibers, and once a year uh, we get uh, like two three hundred fleeces. But lately, I mean, and that's and I mean uh, the last two three years. There was a big, um, uh, I, th I think that there is a big um, waste of, uh, of natural fleeces because uh, during uh, shearing time, like uh, July, June, July, a lot of local shepherds, but also from uh, further away from the south, they call us and they ask us, can you use our wool? Because wool, the wool price is so low on the market and it's, uh, it's more expensive to uh, just, you know, get rid of it than to, um, I mean, people are are, are, um, are burning wool because uh, they have no purpose for this incredible material. And if you can imagine that, um, in, in, I mean, centuries ago, I mean, um, our, one of our currents was wool. I mean, people were, uh, they traded wool uh, for, for uh, other stuff. Wool was the, the main material that kept you warm. So I feel it as a as a big, uh, uh, yeah, also an opportunity, uh, but also as 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 uh, as a big task to um, yeah to 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 show the qualities of this beautiful material and to implement that also in educational processes because a lot of the things we are and a lot of the the things uh, I mean what we see happening is that people have not an awareness or not an idea of that this is something really happening. Um, because um, uh, you, I mean, how would you know, living in a city, that uh, that the price of wool is so low that we just get rid of it? And that's um, that's that's um, that's that's really sad. But it's it is, uh, I think, a beautiful way through art or through makers activism, showing what you can, uh, how you can transform beautiful um, ingredients from nature into something uh, also usable. This is the this is the farm. We grow different crops. We grow vegetables, but also we grow crops for color. We um, we experiment a lot. Uh, uh, the way we farm is uh, called wild gardening. So we try to bring back indigenous plants, plants who belong in that area to uh, to this uh, location. Um, sometimes we uh, we tend to uh, collaborate also with. For example, museums to make museum gardens. We did a recent garden in uh, the Rijksmuseum Twente. Uh, this garden uh, seeing here is uh, a garden we built during uh, the Chelsea Flower Show, showing uh, people working um, as a gardener that you uh, that it's all also, uh, um, I mean, beautiful to, for example, to to uh, to grow nettle in your garden and don't consider it as a wheat but consider it as as richness of your uh, natural palate um this is the the glass the greenhouse the glass house in uh, uh, at the farm uh, we do a lot of workshops there uh, with uh, the Artechnic team uh, re historical reconstructions uh, in the summer we use it 
as a pop-up restaurant. So it's a it's a multifunctional, uh, um, two hundred year old uh, greenhouse uh, coming from Belgium, rebuilt in um, in in the farm. Uh, this year we started a project, uh, the Community Seed Bank for Color. Uh, it's a project um, uh, where we uh, uh, grew a lot of uh, woad, uh, not only on the, uh, in the farm, but we we uh, we have uh, found we found partners uh, in Nether in the Netherlands, but also in Europe, uh, growing woad for us because we would like to see in that experiment um, how the soil and the, 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 the impact of the quality of the soil has on the actual, uh, the, the color coming from boat. So we, uh, we discovered that the, the boat uh, palette from the south of the Netherlands was different than from uh, the west part of the Netherlands, influenced by, by uh, for example, the sea or in the north. So we had... Uh, uh, there was a, a, a very interesting index made after these experiments with a lot of partners showing that a soil related um, uh, growth uh, brings a variety of, of, of colors. And um, the idea behind it was also that uh, farmers uh, who grew the, the crops, but also uh, botanical gardens, uh, individuals, um, natural organizations that they could also, uh, I mean, next year they can also uh, win their own seat. So uh, being independent, having uh, um, yeah autonomy over your uh, your own uh, botanical um, um, menu is uh, is very important to us. I think I have to speed up a little. <laughs> uh, color science and tested knowledge. And here you see an impression of our uh, our dyes lab uh, working with matter. The root takes five years to generate this incredible color, and uh, many variables have impact on the on the quality of of this uh, of this matter root uh, in, in the dye process. Water variable, seawater, rainwater, tap water, uh, harmonized water. They all have impact on the color um, impact on this incredible experiment with uh, matter. This is process of uh, indigo dyeing, um, transformation uh, literally by oxidation. The blue color really appears uh, in this process of making. And uh, ingredients here in, uh, in this uh, reconstruction research, uh, you see here walnut shells, you see different materials like jute, and um, all composing uh, layer by layer this insane uh, palette of uh, Burgundian blacks. Um, an impression of a recipe we, we used. Um, difficult to photograph also the blackness, the darkness, but you can see on the right bottom that the intensity of, of this, this ink spot is so deep. And um, when you uh, keep it in a certain angle in, in sunlight, you really see uh, by absorbing the light that it's really, uh, yeah, it, it really draws you in this in, in this darkness. A lot of handmade uh, labor, uh, handmade hours of time-consuming processes. Um, we, um, yeah, we love doing this because you really actually see what you are doing from carding to to hand spinning, spinning to embroideries, and um, yeah all leading to, um, yeah, very logically, I think, education, citizen science, and makers activism, because the awareness, for example, here, these are master students from, uh, fashion master students from Artes, really growing uh, crops, uh, transforming them into color or flax plant, uh, transforming them into a, a yarn that gives you an awareness of, of, of especially of time, because, uh, uh, being connected to a holistic process of making, you really feel what is needed. You feel the energy needed, uh, really, to to make things. And due, I think, to uh, uh, yeah, to globalization, we completely lost the connection. We lost the connection to seasons. We lost the connection connection to soil. And uh, if you experience a project like this, you also feel that everybody is relevant. Everybody is important. And um, um, yeah, this is a project we did uh, last year, uh, festival, a lot of, of, uh, of uh, communal participation and everybody um, is interested in, in, in these handmade, these old ancient uh, makers uh, qualities. Knowledge is really in your hands by doing. 
um, this is also a, a project we did in uh, uh, next to New York, the reuse of uh, of local wool as a waste product into these panels. Uh, there was a lot of uh, participation from uh, from uh, volunteers and people who work in these gardens to uh, to yeah to make this communal artwork. Um, also, uh, we do uh, a lot of social projects here with. Uh, uh, yeah, you can say victims of uh, human trade, uh, communication by language, or uh, is uh, was was very difficult. But, but communication by making, by weaving, literally connecting, appear to be um, uh, something you know you can really easily um, propose, and uh, people feel uh, connected by using the the materiality that people feel connected feel a connection or uh speaking about uh, color palettes from their own backgrounds appear to be um yeah some key uh, communication tool in this um uh, in this setting another example of uh, makers activism in uh, groningen and um yeah, we do a lot of weaving, also into educational pro processes, reuse of waste materials. And uh, this is uh, uh, the last uh, the last few slides of, uh, of my presentation. We uh, started the foundation uh, this year. It's called Extended Grounds. Um, everything comes together, uh, it's intertwined and um, leads to, uh, uh, yeah, we hope uh, projects that stimulate biodiversity, color, ecology, and inclusivity. And we are, at the moment, we are working on, on a project in uh, southeast of Amsterdam, a uh, very intergenerational project where all these uh, fields of, 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 uh, of connectors are uh, involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Claudie, for, uh, for your talk, it was fascinating to see how diverse your work is. Huh? From uh, yeah, the big, you work together with the biggest artists as Berlin de Bruyker, and also with the biggest institutes, till the the, 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 the most famous fashion designers, but also the, the little projects, uh, which is so fascinating how to combine that. The second speaker today is Anne Sophie Lehmann, and she's closely connected with the work of uh, Claudie Jongstra. Uh, she's Professor of Art History and Material Culture at the University of Groningen. Lehmann studied Art History at the Universities of Vienna and Utrecht. And in Utrecht she received her PhD with a dissertation in the flesh, Jan van Eyck's Adam and Eve panels and the making of the Northern Newt. So that's a, a good link with the very first uh, museum talk we had this year by uh, Max Martes on the exhibition in Ghent, the Van Eyck exhibition in Ghent. In 2002, she became assistant professor at the Department of Media and Culture Studies at Utrecht, where she helped to build the international MA program, New Media and Digital Culture. Lehmann received uh, an NWO Veni grant and fellowships at the Getty Research Institute, the Max Planck Institute, and the research group Bilder Evidence at the Freie Universität. Berlin. Floor is yours. I first gonna put your uh, PowerPoint on. There you go. Floor is yours. Thank you for being here, Anne Sophie. Thank you, uh, Stein Bussels, for the kind invitation and the kind introduction. I'm very happy to be able to speak here today about the work of Claudia Jungstra, although, like some others of you, I would rather have been in situ in the Lagen Hall today, but I hope it's worth the sacrifice. And where between COVID and Trump, it might sometimes seem difficult to see the relevance of art, art is exactly what keeps humans sane and active in difficult times. And as of tomorrow, hopefully, a better future. So, um, in the description for this duo lecture, my part was announced as follows. Lehmann will explore how the materiality of Jungstra's work has a prominent role in its meaning making. Let's see how I might depart on such exploration that I have titled Wolf's Consciousness. For instance, by saying 
that Jungstra's work, which I would very much like to have seen today in real life, is a full body experience that ensnares the entire sensorial apparatus. Vision with its deep and saturated colors, touch through the woolly, silky, and cottony material textures, <clears throat> smell and taste in its wake through the rich palette of organic materials, sound through textility's ability to change the acoustics of a room. I might also state that on the large or minute scale, as garments, samples, hangings, wall, or floor installations, no work will fail to take it along for a ride into the rich history of the materials that gave rise to it. How so? Let me try and explain. Um, longing for the experience of the real thing I have while writing this talk been playing with, and I'm showing this to you here, been playing with a patch of blue and black felt, a stringy mesh with holes and hairy bits that I produced on a cold day in March 2019 during a workshop <clears throat> in Claudi Jungstra studio near Spannen in Frisia. And I would like to show you some impressions that you have already seen. Um, here, part of the workshop took place. And here are some of the participants in the same space that Claudie just showed you. The workshop in which we experimented with felt making and historical recipes for black dye stuff and making ink was held for research master and PhD students of the ne Netherlands National Research School of Art History. It was part of a course which I've been co-teaching with Professor Sven Dupré of Utrecht University, who has been collaborating with Claudia Jungstra for a while. The patch of felt got a place in my study afterwards, a material reminder of the workshop. Looking at the Lacker Hall installation, my little amateur felt experiment fits in very nicely which is pure accident. But this fuzzy object is not only a material reminder. Its colors, shape, and my haptic memory, actually my palms became quite sore from the water and soap used during the felting, allow me to trace the index of its making. I can, based on what I know and have experienced, reconstruct from this thing precisely how it has been produced and how the materials it is made from were produced in their turn. By inference, it becomes possible to unravel any piece by Claudia Jungstra with a view to their making. This is not only interesting if one happens, this is not only interesting <clears throat> if one happens to be interested in artistic processes. It is interesting because, um, because the making of Jungstra's works constitutes a large part of their aesthetic artistic appeal. They have, in other words, a strong processual aesthetics. Due to the environmental philosophy that Jungstra embraces and through her success um, has come to represent, notably also in her new appetite as activist, this making also constitutes meaning. One might say that making and meaning collapse into one another in a manner comparable to the work of other environmental artists, like that, uh, for instance, of Olafur Eliasson. Other artists thus who work collaborative and on a large scale, and whose work raises consciousness for the climate crisis. In Jungstra's work then, procedural aesthetics are intertwined with a material consciousness or even ethics. Both processual aesthetics and the material ethics can be experienced in the work itself, but they are greatly helped by presentation and embedding. The texts, films and photographs and the talks 
that document the process, lay out a trail of breadcrumbs that leads us to follow a work's material index backwards. So after having the sensorial encounter, one can follow this trail. And let's do this together again, because partially you've already done this with Claudie just in a lecture, only that you weren't aware of it. So from a finished work, you turn to its assembling here in the Fries Museum that became Jungstra's extended studio for this work during the months of lockdown. And here are two more impressions. And from there to the room where the spinning, carting and felting of happens on the grounds of Jungstra's uh, studio. And from here back to the coloring workshop where fibers meets dye stuff, where the stuff is put in large pots and where prepared dyes and samples are kept. And here now something important happens. Pigments on the one hand and materials on the other part their ways. And one has to follow two different routes. And what I've uh, listed for you here is how Jungstra lists the ingredients of artworks. Quite unusual because this is so meticulous and with so much The material that you have just seen in beige. Are we going to wait for a moment? And uh, I will ask Anne Sophie to start. Uh, hello, Anne Sophie. Yes. We lost you for uh, for a moment. So we lost you when you showed uh, very meticulously. I put the slide back here. We lost you at this uh, at this slide. Right. I'm sorry. I'm in the university, but there are some connectivity issues apparently. Well, um, it went well. So. Good. Um, so this slide um, I took from the description of one of Claudie's work that she actually already showed you. It's the work four that she did in collaboration with um, Rilene de Bruyckere and the uh, Toneelgroep Maastricht. And here you see how uh, she very meticulously lists the materials involved in a work. And I just want to point your attention to that because that is quite unusual in art history to be so careful. And what you see here in my route to follow materials at, is that we are at a, at a um, crossroad where we, on the one hand, would have to follow the material of wool um, through its harvesting and then to the sheep with which Claudie works. And the other way would lead us to the pigments which uh, may stem from animals, like in this case, or from plant materials, like you see here, uh, which grow in the gardens of Studio Jungstra, but also in, on a larger scale outside uh, in the vicinity of where she lives. So each step on the way that these photos I've just shown you show is in itself again infused with the interaction of materials, of tools and human actions, and the time and effort and patience, and also failures that are bound to be needed and bound to happen. Returning to the work of art with all these places and substances and people in mind, the work now appears as the center of a network through which its meaning is constituted. Such a network might also be called a meshwork to emphasize its thickness or an entanglement to emphasize its mobile and chance nature or an assemblage of practice. All these terms have become established in the field of anthropology and through that in other fields over the past two decennia to describe a similar phenomenon. Things, and in this case works of art, emerge in the skillful collaboration between materials and humans. If Jungstra's art has a societal and didactic ambition, and you just saw that it has, 
it might be to engender a consciousness work in its beholders. In other words, if you see her art, the network becomes visible with it. Ideally, in a next step, not only a beautiful and exciting work of art, but any object would conjure up the network from which it emerged for its users. And once that happens, people have acquired a material literacy and can act accordingly with regard to their environment. The wish to educate a material literacy is not a new one. It has been present at least since the industrialization has fundamentally changed networks of production. Emerging and re-emerging over time, it has currently a greater urgency. For art historians and others invested in object-based humanities, such thinking alongside materials is not so difficult. But to many who have been alienated in a Marxist sense from how things are produced, it is not. And Claudia Jungstra's work might help to develop material literacy and with it, consciousness. In this sense, the re-establishment of a visible network of production that her work accomplishes from sheep to Lakenhall and world plantation to finished artwork makes Jungstra's work also very political, though it might not appear so on the surface. According to Marxist philosopher George Lukács, labor division is part and parcel of Verdinglichung, or reification of objects and subjects that capitalism creates. As defined by Lukács, covers up the original character of things and destroys their, I quote, original and true thingness by separating the production of a thing into distinct steps that can be distributed and evaluated individually. As a consequence, also the worker is reified through a mechanization of her bodily and psychological capacities. Together, this leads to enfremdung, estrangement or alienation. Jungstra's revival of traditions adapted to contemporary sustainability standards works against estrangement because it provides the maker, an overview and overship of the entire process. In doing so, this overview is also offered to the viewer, who can perceive the difference again between the alienated animal laborans and the homo faber, a pair of terms introduced by the German-born American philosopher Hannah Arendt in her book, The Human Condition. In that sense, Jungstra's work is conservative because it returns to pre-industrial conditions and it would be interesting to study how the studio remains a balance between pre- and post-industrial conditions not only in terms of making but also as a corporation and enterprise. In sum, Claudie's work enables us to acknowledge holistic, ethical, political even religious aspects that do not intrinsically belong to materials, but that material affordances draw out in the humans that work them into something. So much for the con in the work of Claudia Jungstra. By way of an extensive conclusion, So the conclusion, we have to wait yeah. a bit of suspense. <laughs> uh, we just uh, missed you when you would say, when, when you said it, you would reach your conclusion, Anne-Sophie. Thank you, Stein. I would like to alert you to the fact that I have not done my job as was announced. I explored Jungstra's work, but not for its materiality. At least I did not use the term not because I avoided it, but because it was not necessary. But what exactly does materiality mean then? The Oxford English Dictionary defines materiality as that which constitutes the matter or material of something, as material or physical aspect or character, 
or as the quality of being composed of matter. But if materiality means that something has the quality of being made, would this not imply that there are also things that do not possess? What kind of thing would not be material? I'm sure you have ideas about that. Maybe things like ideas, like God, spirit and soul or thoughts, fantasy, or everything digital, and language, for example. The latter, thoughts, ideas, fantasy, the digital, or language, are definitely not immaterial. They all capture, they all need material to exist. Brains, bodies, digital infrastructure, mouths, tongues, and signs. The first three, however, spirit, God, or the soul, have been and are shaped by diverse cultural paradigms, and their existence outside of a material domain has been and still is a subject of constant debate. In fact, the term materiality originated in the 17th century, not in order to talk about materials, but to enable this debate, a discourse about the things whose material status was uncertain like God, like the soul. The materiality of the soul was discussed at length by philosophers and scientists, and entire treatises were dedicated to the problem. John Locke, in his famous essay concerning human understanding, pinpointed the dilemma and wrote, he who will give himself leave to consider freely will scarce find his reason able to determine him fixedly for or against the soul's materiality. So, because we cannot know whether God gives a spirit to matter, we also cannot know whether the soul has a materiality or not. Throughout the 17th century, the term materiality is a symptom of this fundamentally theological discussion. Materiality describes how a worldview is radically changed by the scientific revolution and the ensuing enlightenment. Materiality is a concept that tries to envelop uncertainty. It signals doubt about the state of things and describes the attempt to grasp what remains ungraspable. Materiality then, originally, never had the ambition to capture anything concrete. For the concrete was already designated. It did not need the term. Materiality, in short, was a term designated to give material substance to something of which the material existence was unknown. With the word ready, materiality could draw the immaterial into the realm of the material. This is why the term materiality <clears throat> is born and alive in religious debate, but cannot be found in how-to manuals of the early modern period or the medieval period, nor in any discussion of art and craft and technology. You cannot find it in Diderot and D'Alembert's Encyclopedia, in Semper's Practical Aesthetics, nor will you find it in the theory on materials. Because in all these spheres, developed from one, uh, in all these spheres, one knew and still knows rather well what material is, where it is, how to produce something with it, and what its meanings, metaphors, values or cultural implications are. The reason that art history, which had this long tradition of talking about materials, introduced materiality into the discourse around the 2000s is because it had simply forgotten or rather denied its own material thinking. Why? Because it had considered materials a non-theoretical element in the process of becoming a more theoretical discipline. This remains a paradoxical move that is very unique to our discipline. After the term had been reintroduced, it seemed like an entirely new thing, while actually it had for the longest time been at the core of the discipline's vocabulary. Let me give you just one example of this paradoxical situation. When in 2013, 
the art bulletin published uh, in its um, series, Notes from the Field, in which art historians discuss important new directions. The prominent art historians and artists that were asked to reflect on the term, <clears throat> most of the authors, which included Martha Rosler, Carolyn Walker Bynum, Amelia Jones, Michael Kelly, Robin Kelsey, Tristan Vedigan, and Monica Wagner, considered indeed the importance of materials, but none commented on the conceptual status or meaning of the word materiality. Somehow, materiality had become the buzzword to describe everything to do with materials in a vaguely theoretical manner. And that often still holds true today. Even Michael and Holly, the keen historiographer in this illustrious group, wrote in her piece, I regard materiality as the meeting of matter and imagination, the place where opposites take refuge from their perpetual strife. Interestingly, this is completely in line with the theological origins of the term, and at the same time, entirely oblivious of this origin. The questions this beautifully phrased definition begs is, are matter and imagination really opposites? As long as one adheres to a separation of mind and body, idea and matter, it might. But this opposition has long and successfully been challenged. And today, only seven years after Michael and Holly wrote this phrase, it is truly outdated. If in today's art historical discourses, materiality is to be a fruitful term, that helps to understand the things I just tried to voice about Claudia Jungstra's work. That cannot be a term that designates any differences between a world of meta and a world of ideas, or a world of practice and a world of theory. Materiality could only ever be useful as a term that allows for differentiations in analyzing, researching, and finally describing the relation between those domains. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Anne Sophie, for this very inspiring uh, lecture. It's very interesting how you first describe work processes and uh, meanings of, of Claudia Jungstra in order then to bring that theory in uh, of, of materiality, which uh, has such a rich history and then. And, and it interests me a lot because I was thinking, of course, the audience, if you have questions, please put it in uh, in the chat and I will read them aloud for Claudie and or Sophie or, or both. And Sophie, so, so, so please, please uh, put it in the chat. But I, I would like to, 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 to ask the first question. And I think that that question uh, relates to, to both of you. That, of course, in, in art history, uh, as you really pointed very clearly out, uh, materiality is a key term, has, has become a, a very key term. And, of course, your chair at Groningen is, is, is very illustrative for that. Um, another um, uh, evolution, let's say, in, in, in art history starts in the 80s, the 90s, this millennium. And, and, and we now call that visual arts studies in that way that uh, we do no longer want to concentrate on the highest forms of art, but we really want to look at, at, at visuality and how that works in a certain society. And, and by, by listening to uh, Claudia Jungstra's uh, presentation of her work, I was really struck by, on the one hand, you work with big artists uh, as, 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 as Berlinde de Bruyker. On the other hand, you work with, with, with fashion, what, what often still till today is seen as something more ephemeral and not part to that high art because every, every season there's a new fashion, uh, as it were, versus then uh, uh, that, those social projects. So I was so inspired by, by the idea that that this also answers that that new evolution in art history that we do, do no longer concentrate on the canon or even question uh, that canon, etc. So, so in how far can you relate to to that? It's a question to to both of you. Uh, 
Want to feel? Claudia, do you want to go first? Mm -hmm. um, I think um, operating on a micro and uh, macro scale uh, uh, um, demands its own challenges. And I think, um, uh, especially the last, um, I think, years, uh, I think uh, when we uh, work together, I mean, we do a lot of social projects where we work together with students from um, art students from from um, different um, backgrounds. I mean, there is a, uh, and also especially from the Design Academy, uh, there is a big there is a big focus on um, material material sourcing, uh, materiality in that sense. Um, especially, uh, but it's, it's it's always very. Uh, the, the, the approach is always very intellectual and um, having um, experienced that uh, very conceptual too, having experienced that we felt uh, working together with for example the victims of um, a human trade uh, very much connected to, uh, to material as a tool to communicate um, and to to be inclusive, or if you feel that this is the only um, uh, tool you have uh, uh, to express yourself, that gives, uh, for me, it was a completely um, different way to approach um, my main source of material, because I've never thought of that uh, uh, experience, for example, a trauma, that uh, working with um, the material I work with, uh, could um, have a healing impact uh, and by making uh, literally by making uh, small cloth as you showed um, you could really see uh, identities you could see uh, trails you could see history you could see uh, uh, yeah it gave us a lot of information so um, my work has especially in the social part of my work has um, um, yeah put some, um, yeah, some new insights, information of, of how I never have experienced my own, uh, my own work. Mm -hmm. And then how far do you see then in hierarchy in your work or, or not at all like the, yeah, the Biennales, let's say it like that. And then, and, 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 and... We always hoped that it was role modeling. We always hoped that it would uh, generate impact. We always hoped that it would really make uh, people uh, come into action. But um, showing my woven skin work in Italy, uh, in Palermo, where people have deep uh, connection to, uh, for example, where uh, I mean, uh, where meat comes from. I mean, they were not shocked by by the by the visual appearance of my work. Uh, when I showed my woven skin work in the Netherlands, people, a lot of people were shocked. By showing it in different settings and contexts, you see a lot of how people are connected to, you know, especially processes, food processes, especially, but also uh, how we relate with, for example, uh, uh, death. Uh, in Italy, uh, in Palermo, I mean, um, the people were, they responded really very much from their own uh, daily uh, experience to the work. And um, that's always, that's also, um, uh, by Manifesta, um, yeah, gave, uh, I mean, it's, it's a top biennale setting, uh, gave this, uh, this work a setting um, in, in, a, in a position I've never uh, experienced before. Mm -hmm. But we need these podia too. I mean, we need, I mean, artists need these podia to, um, yeah, to, and also that's why that's why I'm connected. Also, um, my fashion is also so influential. I mean, we we see them as 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 as, as a bridge, and to make it possible that that, that an awareness is really uh, evoked. That's why we we connect to uh, to these uh, podia. Mm -hmm. And Sophie, can you uh, react on on in how far the whole idea of visual art studies uh, also together with, of course, materiality? can be used to understand Claude Jungstad's work? Um, I would first like to come back to your uh, question about the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, also, in, 
looking back at the at the recent history of of the field of art history, because initially um, visual studies as well as material culture studies also developed in opposition to art history because art history was about the canon and about um, the works at the Biennale only and excluded um, a lot of stuff. Um, and I think we have now come to a point where for First of all, we, we we should think visual and material culture together, and that is happening as well, um, where these two fields have joined, and where, most importantly, we have finally come to realize that it was never art itself that was exclusive, but that through this new lens of visual studies and material culture, we have been discovering this enormous wealth of historical materials that belong to the history of art, um, and that were not even so much excluded. There have always been people, uh, even very famous art historians like like Alois Riegel or, or mm -hmm. Semper, who have included um, the small things and the ephemeral things and the things made by amateurs in their work. Mm -hmm. But we are now finally starting to to include those parts in in our history and it's beautiful therefore to that in the work of Claudie this sort of reflects what what also happens in our field that you can actually make um high-end artworks that are presented at the the manifestations where you expect to see these and at the same time can, you can have a, a political and and social ethics and work with people on on a different and also that is not new but it has always been thought and opposition mm -hmm. when this when when social art movements started in the 70s you would have not expected them from artists who at the same time would exhibit in the moma i, I mean that that took a long time yeah. and now this can actually happen at in in synchrony and and that's an important absolutely i think also uh, what we experience uh, more and more is that um working um in um commission Commission-based works uh, also um, um, have. I mean, they, they, they their demands have changed because uh, five years ago, uh, uh, for example, uh, an institution would would say, uh, "This is the wall. This is the, this is your podium. Uh, you can uh, make a concept and produce the work." But um, uh, now. Uh, more and more we see experience that there is a different demand from also our commissioners that they they want this long lasting imprint not only in the institution but also the long lasting imprint uh, in the uh, literally in this uh, in the local environment and it can lead to uh, to um, uh, to make for example educational programs from museums related to uh, to uh, to uh, local context but uh, very often, it's 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 also very um, uh, concrete. Uh, for example, we did recently a project in Germany uh, in a very traditional uh, bank, and uh, the the, the uh, there was a there was a big request from um, the commissioners, from the CEOs of the bank, to really make it into not physically a communal work, but to grow gardens next to the bank, to include uh, libraries, to include educational projects. Mm -hmm. So um, not only the artwork itself, but also the, the radius, uh, 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 literally uh, the, the physical radius of the work in the uh, in the in the direct environment was one of the major conditions for for this coalition. Mm -hmm. So that's 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 something. Complete. I mean, uh, five years ago, that would not be uh, something mm -hmm. we had experienced. So this social awareness, the inclusivity, um, especially the the, um, um, the reputation of uh, of farmers uh, being under pressure. You know, we, uh, we see that artists can play a role in that. That you can really have influence also uh, on uh, role modeling farmers in a completely different uh, uh, context. Mm -hmm. Interesting. There is a question by Louise Vanet uh, for uh, for Claudi. Uh, how uh, do you differentiate which works are deemed art? So then, of course, that that word art, and which ones are architecture? 
when in the architectural process does your work come into play and what is the role of site specificity in your architectural works um every uh every artwork made uh, i would say together with an architect uh, in a very early stage in the collaboration uh, where the demand uh, of the architect or the, the, the dialogue and the discussion of architects and artists is that implementing art and architecture uh, having a, for example a spatial uh, function or uh, having a really impact on uh, the experience of the space uh, is a very different uh, uh, starting point than uh, for example in a museum setting when there is just, you know, the, you have the stage, uh, you can make a concept, of course, related uh, to, uh, to a certain theme or a certain uh, exhibition. But um, works in architecture have always a relationship either with the user of the building, for example, in, uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, the library, uh, and uh, should also communicate the relationship between building and user. Uh, so that's, uh, that's always... Uh, that's also very often uh, the case. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, a question for Anne Sophie. What kind of projects your students are working at the moment? Uh, because uh, Louisa Humpe is interested to link M M MBO students with university students. Uh, we already worked with Claudie in educational programs for our students and teachers. Alpha Fantastic idea. And, and I would just, I invited uh, Louisa just to contact me about this because we have students working on related projects. And yes. All right, great. Claudie, do you think, uh, a question by Dana Decker, do you think the activist possibilities of your artworks should be the focus of your artworks? Should the aesthetic qualities of your artworks be separated from the possible meaning, the purpose, or are they intertwined? I think that's a, that's a marriage. They, <laughs> they have uh, connected themselves both uh, to, but I think um, um, the woven skin work uh, was my first installation uh, um, init initiated by uh, by the studio to make a work um, coming really from um, um, inner reflection and not because there was um, there was no um, there was no there was no commissioner in 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 that in that situation so that was really a work coming from nothing what is needed to uh, express the the, um, the language of uh, myself uh, two years ago uh, uh, and uh, show this in a in a, in, in a journey the different locations and um, I had not uh, I mean I had no in that sense users. Uh, audience, uh, I had not to guarantee 40 to 50 years in a building. Sometimes we have to guarantee a certain conservation um, um, uh, period, and 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 um, so there were, in that sense, no boundaries. Um, and it was for me a very important, not literally to make a work that would really shock people, but that this is what happened because. Um, I really uh, expressed the, the inner uh, concern I have related to uh, social exclusivity and also to to, uh, to climate uh, urgencies. So, uh, but very often we, um, you know, the user of a building or the the visitor of a public space. Uh, uh, I mean, my yeah, I feel it is my duty also and my my task to to make a connection. And uh, the connection can be very often via aesthetic, aesthetic works, because mm -hmm. um, um, you want the dialogue to be opened at the end. Or, um, I mean, um, I don't want to... Uh, the, 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 the expression of the work uh, and the, the connection to, to the people experiencing the work, especially in, in public buildings, is very essential to me, mm -hmm. to make a connection, to make really a connection. Preferably a physical connection, but not always allowed, of course, to touch the work. But um, uh, very often, very much invited, welcoming, put people at ease. A moment mm -hmm. for population uh, in hospitals. Uh, with so many different uh, settings where my work is. Um, and um, uh, yeah, um, so uh, in that sense, uh, for me, the connection with 
with uh, with experience and really making um, yeah a gesture a welcoming gesture is very important yes and maybe to go even a step further because uh, when you visit the lac and how you can take a little uh, cloudy youngstra with you of course you can buy the cloth you you made so 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 for for not such a for for real uh, for, for 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 not the prices you you pay for for the, the big works so in that way you by taking it home it's also uh really having it and experiences experience your work or do you see that differently do you see that as another order the 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 cloth you can buy in uh, in the lacanal i think uh uh, yeah, what is uh, what is uh, what is very uh, essential? I think when you enter the Lagen Hall, you get this small card with this uh, woolen uh, indigo dyed uh, drenth heat um, uh, yarn. Uh, that's that's for a lot of people the first uh, uh, contact with with uh, with uh, the color material, uh, the color uh, indigo, uh, and also the. Uh, the material dread heat. So for a lot of people, it's, it's completely uh, out of their comfort zone. And um, um, I think it's a, it's a, it's it's very important that people um, can experience tactility, physical tactility, uh, because uh, uh, especially in, in in these moments of you know not touching, it becomes quite essential. It, it gives a complete different. Uh, uh, also, uh, I mean, touch was never so. The lack of touch was never so. Um, uh, in uh, yeah, something we were so aware of uh, the last months. And uh, yeah. I also hear that back a lot from people. Uh, the work makes you really feel, you know, uh, yeah, in a sense, also filling a gap. Yes. Great. A question for Anne Sophie uh, of uh, our fellow, uh, our visiting fellow from China, Hui Ming Jia. Uh, in how far uh, the the artworks, uh, by by relating them to materiality, can we not all also make the process of making uh, the the works that Claudie makes as kind of a spiritual ritual? Huh? Could we see uh, so? So, in how far can uh, these also be be seen from a ritualistic? Point of view, because the process is maybe as important as the result. Yes, there there is certainly um, th there is a long history uh, of of especially uh, artworks that are produced for religious contexts. That also the process is a large part of that religious meaning. Um, I'm just thinking of uh, embroideries. Uh, actually from China by Chinese nuns that use um, their own hair, which is a very slippery and tough material and, and, and it will hurt you, hurt your eyes and your fingers to embroider with it. And that uh, that pain, also painful process was also part of, um, of the work that would result in it. So, um, and the same is, is of course true for, for many works of, of pottery. Also, I think once we start looking in th into that direction, we may find an incredible amount of examples. If they have to be ritualistic in a religious sense, depends, of course, on on the individual artwork and its context. So I wouldn't want to say um, that what I sketched with regard to, to Cloudy's work, that sort of um, virtual reconstruction and what that evokes, um, that that would be necessarily religious no i don't think but that's maybe ritual, more a ritual making the making is more as to can, can can be seen as a ritual not so much a religious ritual as so. i if you well rituals rituals tend to be um determined by um by some kind of procedure while as making is determined by the affordances of the material and will accordingly change. Mm -hmm. With a different material and a different experience, you have to change making. So if you would then keep to the ritual for ritual's sake, that would be in contrast to one another. So it depends very much on what, what you defined as ritualistic yes. as opposed to making. I think also a um, sense of place, for example. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, there was a big sense of you know when you see when you when you see, uh, for example, the, the big weaving uh, industry in Twente. 
um, related very much to uh, to this to this uh, to, to this to this to this location. I mean, it gave also a lot of uh, proudness, you know, when people make things on a certain place, and uh, this is related to uh, to the to to. to to craftsmanship and to soil and to qualities only uh, as a scene in a, in a certain location. I think you also have a lot of, uh, um, I mean, that gives a lot of identity too. And um, I think that's also what we see is if you with we with the project Community Seed Bank for Color, when you have farmers in in Zeeland producing uh, Zeus Blue, it gave them a lot of you know uh, feeling of. Uh, of, of, of quality, this is what we can make, and the farmers in in Friesland, they were proud to have Friesian blue. So um, uh, connected to place, I think that's something we are very interested in to explore. What can people do on certain places? What is their what is their um, uh, um, uh, geographically? What is that DNA? And do you still feel that in uh, in in their making of of things and um, so that's very interesting also for uh, for the next phase in our project um, mm -hmm. to see um, how that relates. Oh, great. There's another question about the waste of fleeces uh, by Claudia. Uh, what would you suggest can be done to prevent this? So people value this wool again. Do you think the fleeces can become useful again in a circular economy? How could this happen? Yeah, I'm shocked. Uh, I mean, I'm shocked uh, every year. I, I cannot believe that we uh, that there is not a construction company in the Netherlands or uh, outside of the Netherlands saying, "Can we? Why don't we use uh, this natural wool as an insulation material?" Because mm -hmm. this is what we used to do, and uh, we have uh, experimented also with um, uh, clay, uh, rent clay construction, uh, incorporating also wool because that was done in uh, in Morocco. Uh, cultures a lot because the, 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 the lightness of wool and the, and the texture of wool, the, the, the insulation quality of wool in combination with the clay gives a beautiful uh, construction material. Uh, and I think um, there is a whole field of, of, uh, of applications to be, de uh, to be developed. Uh, if you look back in certain cultures, European cultures, because uh, I mean, uh, this is what, what we had here. We had, um, Thousands of sheep uh, we still have in Italy, uh, uh, and the wool is is uh, be, being considered and seen as a waste material because there is not an application for it. And the other thing is, um, um, I mean, we are trying to make a local, I mean, a, a Dutch woven uh, cloth, uh, but the spinning industry, the spinning process from flock to yarn, that's something. Um, uh, uh, there is no infrastructure for that in uh, in the Netherlands or in in in, in I mean there are not many uh, uh, mills who can spin uh, really can spin yarns. So we um, uh, with uh, exporting a lot of our materials to, for example, uh, eastern countries because it was much cheaper doing it there. Processing a lot of the knowledge is gone, but also we don't have any tools. We don't have any. Uh, machines we don't have uh, the infrastructure of making a yarn so we have to go now for our for us uh, for our yarns we have to ship the dutch wool to ireland there's still some small uh, mills and then back to the netherlands to twente to make it into a, uh, a woven uh, material so um uh, there are so many opportunities uh, to reuse uh, especially um the the, the woolen um, yeah, our woolen uh, culture, but um, the, the, there is no industry. We have um, uh, we have lost our industry. The process of uh, of, of making, especially the is gone. Thank you. A question by Janina Rose. Uh, when you think at big fashion houses who promote sustainability, like Vivian Westwood's uh, buy less, would you say this is hypocritical? since they remain to drive on commerce by bringing out huge collections at least four times a year? Or are the buyers responsible for this awareness of consumption? Do you think this is a cyclical, uh, a cycle which can be stopped ultimately? 
Um, I think uh, there is, uh, of course, a uh, responsibility to the consumer, to the government, uh, to everybody involved in the making process of uh, even fast fashion is, is a phenomenon coming up. Uh, uh, we have now collections uh, two, two weekly. Uh, every two weeks there is a new collection. Uh, so uh, um, the... Yeah, I think where we can play or what we try to play a role is uh, in education. So uh, if we, because I believe in change and change starts, I mean, a lot of change starts in, in educational uh, processes. So uh, uh, yes, big fashion brands have responsibility. I mean, we, we see that, uh, that they take that, that they take the responsibility, but it's very complex. It's a very complex uh, problem, mm -hmm. but if young designers uh, refuse uh, working in this system, because I think if you just um, say no uh, and uh, try to uh, to have an awareness and an, uh, and, and and a connection to to local qualities to um, to vet, to develop the, the the rural potentials, I think there is a, there is an opportunity also, especially now for the new uh, generation of fashion designers to really make the change. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that, uh, that there is a big um, uh, challenge also to connect them, especially in the Netherlands, the MBO, the lower uh, the practical um, um, uh, educational schools. Uh, we see uh, that they are uh, very often alienated from materi materials, alienated from, uh, from uh, literally make, I mean, they are makers, but uh, they, uh, the, the value of, of their craftsmanship, the, 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 the way we see, uh, the way they see themselves, um, I mean, if they respect that, uh, that, that making things is something uh, like cement in a society, uh, I think that's a, that, the, that the vitality of making is so needed for, uh, for, uh, for a beautiful community, I think um, uh, we give them, we can give them a big podium because we have so many, uh, uh, so many of them um, to really uh, make a change in the making. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The very last question by Anna uh, Reusta Havermann. Uh, how does your work age, short and long term? This is speculation, of course. How will people be able to see your work in the museum in the future, circa 2004? 400 or is a consequence of the sustainable and circular material that it is less stable or is it actually very durable and thus another meaning sustainability um i i think the the i think i have 20 22 years uh, is the oldest work i have in the building um if the conditions if the conditions are quite stable um, we see uh, that the conditions are really well, but for example, um, uh, when the work is in a in a, in a semi-public space with open doors, uh, very sensitive to this, uh, yeah, uh, humidity. Um, um, uh, um, I mean, there, there is no constant in humidity that has big impact on the on the condition of the of the of the work, but um, uh, very often. Um, People accept the, that the condition uh, changes. That in in winter times, for example, in New York, um, uh, the, the work is um, is bellying back, and in the summer, because of the humidity, you know, it it looks completely different. So if you communicate it, also uh, people uh, are uh, are very accept acceptable in uh, in this condition change of my material, but. Um, for now, I, we only have experience with work maximum 22, 22 years in a, in a, in a building. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's also materiality, I guess, on Sophie, that, that, that you know that things can disappear, can, can, can move away far earlier than, than often expected. Yeah, it's just part of materials, uh, time span and interaction with other materials like air and humidity and touch and sweat and so um that all together is part of of that network uh, in which an artwork exists touch is a very difficult one because people can be really greedy and just take you know part of the work home nobody sees yeah, yeah. so um, textiles are extremely because they 
they really trigger your your haptic um, mm. your haptic sense more than than smooth surfaces. So people really want to touch, like you want to you know caress an animal or something. You and then it's probably easy because I mean, from a bronze sculpture, you cannot take a piece, but then wool it sort of offers this opportunity. We allowed uh, in the uh, in the library of Amsterdam. Uh, we allow people to touch it, and uh, people uh, in now in I think the last ten years uh, there were you know some beautiful interactions. People made you know uh, put in some small uh, jewelry, or you know uh, people really changed that work. So once in a while we have to go there and to uh, we are there for a few days and to. Uh, um, do a big restoration uh, job because um, uh, yeah, uh, physical touch really has impact on uh, on the work. That's true. Great. All right. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you everyone for being here and asking the questions. I really uh, really like the combination of Claudie presenting her work and also Sophie relating it to 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 issues. Uh, which, which really give, give our understanding uh, more profundity. It's a pity we could not do this in the Lakenhal, so I do want to thank everyone from the Lakenhal once again uh, for all their help, and, and let's hope that we soon can, uh, can visit uh, the exhibition of uh, Claudie Jungstra. Thank you both, Claudie and Anne-Sophie. Bye-bye. Thank you, Stein. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.